One of the most critical parts of anyone's journey into academia or a research career is starting their PhD. This video will cover two key aspects of landing an amazing PhD. The initial contact with your prospective supervisor and the interview process. I'll also cover other important topics relating to applying for a PhD, but other videos will cover concepts like how to decide whether a particular PhD supervisor is right for you and how to make that difficult choice between multiple potential PhD supervisors. It's important to note that what a supervisor is looking for in a prospective student and what an organisation like a university is looking for in a prospective student can vary hugely depending on the country, depending on the organisation and depending on the specific supervisor. What I'll cover in this video is a range of things you can do or consider that should help in many of the most common situations. A typical researcher who is established in their field and has a good profile, especially in a topical field like anything in computer science, for example robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning or computer vision, is often handling hundreds if not thousands of PhD applications every year. Typically these applications come in the form of an email with some text or a cover letter attached to the email as well as a CV. Now you can imagine even for an organized supervisor individually responding to hundreds or thousands of inquiries per year is just not practical and so a lot of these inquiries go unanswered. A typical potential PhD supervisor is also a very busy academic and so they can only devote a tiny fraction of their time to this important activity of looking at, assessing and vetting potential PhD students. At the same time, all hope is not lost. Many academics have a number of research projects that they desperately need PhD students for. And so while they're very busy, it's in their interest to make the time to talk to you about a potential PhD with them, especially if you can put forward a compelling case. Well, what type of PhD supervisors might you be approaching? Well, simplifications can be useful as long as you treat them as exactly what they are, simplifications. And there are really two categories of PhD supervisor you can be approaching. The first type of supervisor is a senior, accomplished academic who probably leads a fairly large team and is very busy, but is also very experienced at supervising PhD students. The second type of potential supervisor is a more junior academic. For example, a new assistant professor in the United States. They are often less experienced at supervising PhDs and while busy, may have slightly more time and more prioritization of recruiting PhD students for their team. In terms of the approach to recruiting that supervisors might use in talking to potential PhD students, once again, it's useful to think of two primary categories of supervisor. The first type is what I would call the idealist. So they're really excited about recruiting. They're interested in talking to students with great potential, students who come perhaps from unorthodox backgrounds. And these supervisors will sometimes expend huge amounts of effort and time in talking to and investigating potential PhD candidates. The second type of PhD supervisor is what I would call the cynic or the realist, uh, depending on your perspective. This PhD supervisor is very concerned with avoiding the risk of making a bad PhD appointment. And they will risk missing out on good PhD appointments in order to make sure or minimize the chance that they will appoint someone who is just not a suitable fit for their team. Their process will, as a result, be somewhat impersonal at the early stages of the process, especially when compared to the idealist. Obviously, these are simplifications. There are many other types of recruiting philosophies and most PhD supervisors will lie somewhere on the spectrum between these two extremes. Another key factor you should consider when applying for PhD programs is the length of the PhD program, which can vary substantially between different countries and organizations. 
for example, in Australia and other countries like the UK, some of the PhD programs are a remarkable three years long, which is quite short for a PhD. Whereas in other countries like the US, you might expect a PhD program to run for four to six years, so up to double the duration. And the length of the PhD program has a significant effect on the type of recruiting and the way in which recruiting is done at the PhD level. So what's in the typical email approach from a prospective PhD student to a prospective PhD supervisor? There's a few common elements, hopefully a clear and concise subject heading, an email body that explains why the student is approaching the supervisor and why they're interested in doing a PhD with that supervisor, the sort of research topic that they're interested in pursuing and how perhaps that links into the research that that supervisor does in their own group. Some students will go out of their way to personalize the email in great detail to the specific supervisor that they're approaching. This can never hurt, but especially for busy supervisors, you need to remember that there's a distinct possibility the supervisor will just not see your email at all. So you need to balance the amount of effort you put into any one application with the realities of the application process. Once the supervisor has received your email and hopefully opened it and read it, there's a few things that they're looking for. A key thing to remember is that they're typically not trying to make a final decision on whether to appoint you as a PhD student at this stage. All they're trying to do is work out whether you are worthy of further due diligence, which often comes in the form of some emails back and forth or perhaps a series of interviews. At that initial stage, a typical supervisor would be looking for two types of things. Based on the PhD projects that they have in their lab, there will be some non-negotiable critical skill sets or experiences that they may require for a PhD, especially for one of the shorter duration PhDs where there isn't the time to pick up all of the skills fresh during the PhD. You need someone to come in who is already experienced in some of these areas. Then there will be a bunch of nice to haves but not critical skill sets and experiences that the supervisor is looking for. The important thing to remember here is that there isn't a rigid set of requirements typically of these nice to haves. So if you've done coding but perhaps not in quite the right language, that is still potentially a positive even if you might end up working in a different language for your PhD. One of the necessary artifacts of a PhD is to publish, hopefully in top tier high quality venues. And so if you have some experience of publishing research papers before starting your PhD, that is always a bonus. A lot of people agonize around whether the papers they've published already are papers where they are first author or a secondary author. This can be important, but your main aim here is to get to the interview stage. At the interview stage, the supervisor is going to likely dig into more detail about what exactly you contributed to on the paper, regardless of whether you are a first author or a secondary author. For many people, especially young PhD students, a PhD will be the largest single project they've taken on in their entire life. One of the risks with a PhD, of course, is that some people don't adjust very well to focusing so narrowly and so deeply over such a long time frame on a single project. And so if you have past experience of evidence of having worked on a project in deep detail over a sustained period of time, that is a great thing to add into your case. It doesn't even necessarily have to be in the relevant area to your PhD topic, just to provide evidence that you have been able to work on deep detailed projects successfully in the past. Of course, having highly relevant technical skills is always a plus. And so, for example, if you are in a computer science field, if you have deep coding expertise, if you have experience with machine learning, computer vision, or robotic software packages, you should list those things because they are great additions to making your case for the PhD. If you've done research or technical projects beyond the bare minimum required for your undergraduate or master's degree, please put those in. They indicate that you've had some ambition and drive to extend yourself, 
They indicate that you've perhaps picked up extra skills that a typical undergraduate who's graduating from their degree might not have. And once again, the deeper and more detailed these projects have been, the better. Once a supervisor has looked at an application over email and decided that they're interested in the potential PhD student, there may be some further emails exchanged back and forth, but the next critical step will be a single or series of interviews with the supervisor. It's important to realize that a good supervisor during the interview process is not trying to embarrass you or humiliate you. They are trying to do the due diligence to check that you would be a really good fit for the types of PhDs that they have going in your lab. A good PhD supervisor will be grateful for the time you've taken to apply and the time you've taken to prepare for the interviews. And a good supervisor will not expect you to know the answers to everything they ask you in the interviews. And indeed, how you handle uncertainty or when you don't know the answer to something is actually a hallmark of an interesting interview. A lot of PhD applicants will prepare a short presentation of the research or technical work that they've done already. Not all prospective supervisors actually need to see this during the interview process. It's very much a personal preference. If you've done a good job with your CV and your cover letter, a lot of this information will already be fairly clear and the need for a presentation may not be there. One of the key purposes of the interview process is to see how well you communicate when talking about technical research. The supervisor doesn't know who wrote your cover letter, who wrote your CV, but in the actual interview where you're talking back and forth and interacting, that is their way to determine your level of communication skills and your comfort with talking deeply about technical research. Another key purpose of the interview is to determine much more concretely your level of intellectual input into all of those projects and papers that you've listed on your CV. And once again, accuracy is important here. A supervisor doesn't expect you to have made all of the intellectual contributions to all of these projects and papers. What they're looking for is an accurate summary of exactly where you did contribute, where you played a supporting role, in order that they get a much more accurate portrayal of your accomplishments today. Another key part of the interview process that's often done is a technical interview. During the technical interview, the supervisor is trying to assess your level of competence and comfort with key technical tasks that you might be performing during your PhD. In computer science, typical tasks would be things like coding or programming and also your mathematical background. As I said earlier, a good supervisor will not expect you to know everything at this stage of your life. What they will be looking for is evidence of your capacity to rapidly learn new concepts. And so the supervisor may go through some hypothetical research scenarios to get a feel for how you think about things, how easily you come up with new ideas or concepts in order to evaluate this. During the interview process, although it may not be explicit, a supervisor will be assessing your ability to fit into the lab culture that they've built up. Now this does not mean that they are looking to hire identical people to each other and a good lab will have a very diverse range of researchers in it. What they are looking for is to see evidence that you are collegial, you are going to integrate well into the team, you're going to be an asset to the culture of the group and you're going to leave your own stamp and contributions on the group. What else can you do during the interview? Well, you as the applicant have the opportunity to ask questions. You can ask your potential supervisor about their supervisory style. You can ask them about the size and composition of their current PhD team. You can ask them about what support initiatives and group activities there are in the research group. You can pretty much ask any reasonable question that would help you as an applicant make a better judgment for whether this is a lab you want to work in. If there are certain constraints on you, you can also mention them near the end of the interview. For example, you may have to give notice at your current role, which might delay you commencing by several months. 
You may have geographical or visa-based restrictions. Once again, these can cause delays. You may have financial considerations, like you will need to obtain a scholarship in order for this PhD program to be financially viable for you. As with all things that involve an element of social interaction, practice makes perfect, especially if you are relatively inexperienced at interviews. So you can practice in front of a mirror, you can practice with a student or colleague, you can practice with your family members. One of the things you can do is practice common scenarios that occur in interviews. So you will not know the answer to every question in an interview. And so at some stage, you may give a bad or incomplete answer to a question. What's important at that stage is that you know how to recover and go on strong to the next questions. And that's something that you can get better at with practice. You can also practice the length and clarity and conciseness of your answers. For example, one thing people might do in an interview is give an initial concise answer and then ask the questioner whether they would like more detail. And that's something else you can practice and get better at. Even if you are a stellar PhD applicant, it still very much is a numbers game. As I said earlier, sometimes even really compelling PhD applications will just get lost amidst the hundreds or thousands of other applications. And so you are best off getting efficient and comfortable with putting in a number of applications to various destinations of your choice. As you prepare all of these applications, you will rapidly get better at it. The same goes for the interviews. As you do more and more interviews, you'll rapidly become much more proficient at doing a great job in them. The skills you develop and refine during the whole PhD application process, skills like approaching people, pitching your compelling value proposition, and doing interviews are lifelong skills. You will use and reuse these skills for the rest of your professional career. And so the PhD application process is a great way to get started at becoming better at these things. As a supervisor, one of the most enjoyable parts of my job is meeting young, enthusiastic and exciting new researchers. And I meet many of them through talking to potential PhD applicants. It's a really important part of your early career and I wish you all the best of luck in searching for your PhD.